I want to talk about applications of um, mean curvature flow in general relativity. So, um, what I want to understand in general relativity is isolated gravitating systems. So, you should think of um, um, stars black holes, also binary systems, and even galaxies. Anything that can be separated from the rest of the universe. So this is not, not about cosmological models, looking for the, trying to describe the whole universe, but isolated objects. Now, these things um, in general relativity are modeled by some Lorentzian manifold, so it's four-dimensional, it's a Lorentzian metric, so it has one negative eigenvalue everywhere and three positive eigenvalues. And uh, <coughs> this is called space-time. And uh, now this on the space-time, you have Einstein's equation. You have that the Ricci curvature of the Lorentzian metric minus one-half the scalar curvature of the Lorentzian metric times the metric itself is equal to 8 pi times the energy momentum tensor. So this is uh, Ricci curvature. This here is the scalar curvature, the trace of the Ricci curvature. And this here contains uh, information about the matter fields that do not come from gravitation. So this is energy momentum. This tensor is divergence-free, which corresponds to energy and momentum conservation. And this tensor, therefore, is also divergence-free. And that's a well-known fact, the Bianchi identity in differential geometry. So you have this balance between geometry and matter um, in uh, general relativity. And <clears throat> this is an invariant equation, a very geometric concept. And uh, the question is, how can you relate the geometry of this Lorentzian 4-manifold to classical physical concepts like mass, momentum, angular momentum? Uh, can you describe it also in terms of geometry? Because it should not depend on the particular coordinate system. The whole point of Einstein's theorem is covariance. It has to be geometric. It should not depend on the coordinate system. So you have to translate all the physics into geometry. So the task is find geometric uh, structures to model phys physical concepts. Now this, the simplest case is of course a, a light ray. Um, you know that's a t that is a null geodesic in this space time or a test particle is a time-like geodesic in the space-time. That would be examples for geometric concepts for physical objects. What I'm interested in for these isolated gravitating systems is uh, I want to understand mass, uh, center of mass of the system, and uh, later, of course, but I don't uh, get to that, and we don't understand it very well, you also want things like momentum and angular momentum. Okay. So to do that, to relate things to, um, to uh, classical physics, you have to break up space-time into space and time. Um, and how do you do that? Well, in this Lorentzian manifold, L4H, 
you have to put somehow space. Now space will be some space-like hypersurface. So let me draw it like this. So there may be a black hole here. And then this thing moves. Say this star is on a collision course with this black hole. And then as time goes on, Maybe, yeah, I don't know what happens here. And so on. So you break up space-time into a foliation of uh, three-dimensional manifolds, uh, which carry an induced metric and carry a induced second fundamental form with respect to the four-manifold. And you do this in such a way that you everywhere transverse to the light cone. Because you want this to be resembling space. And then here I sort of indicate that this three-dimensional hypersurface will be curved. Like here's a, a star. And, here, and then there may be some boundary, like the horizon of a black hole. And such a thing here, such a set of a three manifold with a metric and a second fundamental form is called an initial data set. And you can prove that if you specify G, the metric, and a three dimensional Riemannian metric, you, you see, if this is transverse, to the light cone, this metric here will be Riemannian, not Lorentzian. You can prove um, that if, let's show K uh, Bria a long time ago in the 60s, proved that if G and K are compatible in the sense of satisfying Gauss and Kodatsi equations, then you can given such initial data, find a so unique solution of the Einstein equations in the neighborhood uh, of your initial data. Yeah? So this is, you, you get a well postness problem for these hyperbolic systems of equations, um, reducing it to a system of first order differential equations for the metric G and K, and the, and the second fundamental form K. But this is not, not the topic of today's talk, but I want to talk about is to try to find these concepts of mass and center of mass in terms of this metric G. The data K will contain um, dynamic information. This is, you should think of this is how the status is of space at the time T, and this is somehow the speed. Because this is a hyperbolic system, you have to prescribe sort of U and U dot. You should think of the metric as the initial data, and this is the speed of the initial data. And so you need this thing here to encode dynamical information about the uh, sp system. Um, but if you only want mass and center of mass, these are things that do not depend on the dynamics. So you hope to describe the concepts of mass and center of mass purely in terms of the metric G. Yeah. So aim, so this is a slightly restricted aim now, understand mass and center of mass on M3G without using K. But I need to put some restriction, right? I, I, this cannot be just anything. It has to be something reasonable in terms of this physical setting. If I have no restriction, there's no hope I can do something. So what is a good restriction? First of all, you have to make a good choice of this Riemannian 3 manifold. It's no use to put a Riemannian 3 manifold which looks like that. Right? It's not, not good. You want to go through as straight as possible. So a good choice is to ask that the trace with respect to G here of K 
is identically zero. This is the mean curvature of the three manifold with respect to the Lorentzian four manifold. So you ask that this is equal to zero. If it's space like, this is an elliptic equation, very similar to the minimal surface equation, slightly different. So if, if, if this is a, uh, so if the M3 is the graph of some function u sitting in Minkowski space, then this equation here is uh, equivalent to saying that di of di u over square root of 1 minus du squared is equal to 0. And those of you who know the minimal surface equation, of course, recognize if I have a plus here, it's the minimal surface equation. But because of the minus sign in space-time, you get for zero mean curvature is now this equation. And it makes sense exactly if du squared is less than 1, which means the thing is space-like inside Minkowski. So this is an elliptic equation if du squared is less than 1. And that's why this is a reasonable condition. You can solve this. This is a theory of its own that you can find. In any reasonable space-time, you can find such a foliation of so-called maximal slices. This is so-called maximal gauge. Again, it's not a minimal surface, it's a maximal surface locally because of the different sign. So that's the first choice you make. And then the second thing is you have to listen to the physicists about T alpha beta. And you cannot just put any T alpha beta, otherwise it's just um, T alpha beta is just defined by the left hand side and you have no reasonable restriction. So the uh, so make, you make this mathematical choice and you ask the physicist for an energy condition. So you accept an energy condition from physics. And the energy condition that the physicists tell you is uh, all matter that they know, described by T alpha beta, has the property that energy can never jump in space-like direction. It can only move in time-like direction. And it can only move in a, it has a positive density when you measure it in time-like direction. Mathematically, this means that the right-hand side applied to any time-like vector x is greater or equal to zero. Okay. Now, once you accept this from the physicist, everything turns into differential geometry because then you have just a condition on the curvature of the four-dimensional space-time uh, that this curvature on the left-hand side applied to time-like vectors is greater or equal to zero. Think of it somehow energy is focusing. Energy is attractive. It's not repelling. Now, if you put that in, to the Einstein equations, and you use now the Gauss equations on this three-dimensional hypersurface, use these assumptions and use the Einstein equations together with the Gauss equations. A little computation so you, 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 you put this in, you may put this choice in, and you use the Einstein equations. Einstein equations, and you compute then that the scalar curvature on the three manifold is equal to uh, the second fundamental form squared minus the trace of the second fundamental form squared. By the way, this would be with a different sign, switching these two would be the standard formula for a three-dimensional hypersurface in R4. Scalar curvature is equal to the second elementary symmetric polynomial. But here, because of the minus sign, it's the other way around. And you get from the right-hand side, you get um, 16 pi t alpha beta times n alpha 
and beta, so this is the Gauss equations, if n is the unit normal to these hypersurfaces. And that's a time-like vector because the hypersurfaces are space-like. And then, so this guy is greater or equal to zero. We make the assumption that this one is equal to zero and we make the energy condition that this is greater or equal to zero. So we conclude that the whole thing is greater or equal to zero. So, so this now gives me my setting. So, <coughs> so from all this, I now have the task. I want to study a three-manifold, a Riemannian three-manifold, Riemannian manifold, so no, not Lorentzian, this is now Riemannian, with scalar curvature of the, this is a three-dimensional scalar curvature, greater or equal to zero, and I assume that because it's an isolated system that near infinity uh, it looks like a flat space. So I assume that G of X approaches the standard metric as mod X uh, tends to infinity. And uh, <coughs> Right. So examples. The first one is, of course, you just take standard R3 with the standard metric. Then this is just the plane in uh, Minkowski. Minkowski space. It's a trivial example, the ground state, as the physicist would say. More interesting is uh, this one here. If you take M3G to be, take R3 without the origin and take the metric to be, depending on some parameter M, to be conformal to the standard metric, 1 plus m over 2r to the power 4, where m is some positive constant and r is just mod x in these coordinates. Now if you draw a picture of this, of this space, you get something like that. Get, get it. two planes connected by a neck and the upper side is where you get r tending to infinity and this side is where r tends to zero and you have a reflection symmetry here where r equals m over 2 this metric if you do a reflection um, in these coordinates sending x2 x over x squared in the inversion, then, then this is the fixed point in this uh, geometry. And uh, so this is a minimal surface. This is, and, and the physical interpretation is that this is uh, uh, the t equals zero uh, slice contained in the Lorentzian four manifold named by Schwarzschild, which is a static black hole. So it's a, this is the ground state for black holes. And in this case, the interpretation is that M is the mass. 
of the black hole, which you can find out uh, by comparing with Kepler orbits. That's indeed, this is the right interpretation. M is the mass. And um, in this case, we are exactly, because of this uh, conformal thing here, you can compute what the scalar curvature is. Turns out you just get the Laplacian of this uh, bracket here. And the Laplacian in R3, of course, of this is uh, zero because it's a fundamental solution. So you get that the scalar curvature of this metric here is identically zero. So we are exactly in the borderline case. which has to do with the fact that it's static. It means there is no energy except the black hole itself. There is no other energy present in the system except the black hole represented by its horizon. So this thing here is the horizon of the black hole. And notice that the, you can compute what is the area of the horizon. You notice that 16 pi m squared is the area of this um, boundary of the ball of radius m over 2. So the, somehow the size of the black hole measured in terms of its horizon is um, proportional to the square of the mass. Mass scales like distance. That's the most important non-trivial example for a isolated gravitating system where you have sort of no matter and uh, yeah so if you want to compare yeah just compare this with Newton here for a second compare with Newton in Newton you have just you, the space you're dealing with is R3 and you have some non-negative density density with um, uh, compact support and then you have a potential u which satisfies Laplace u equals 4 pi rho So this is the equivalent somehow of Einstein's equations and you can say rho greater or equal to zero somehow equivalent to uh, scalar curvature greater or equal to zero. This is second derivatives of the metric so g plays the role of the potential u in uh, general relativity. This is a trace of second derivatives just like this is a trace of second derivatives. And now for Newton, it's clear what the mass is. For, for Newton, the mass is just um, uh, integral rho, dx of r3, right? Now, the important point to notice is that this is, of course, completely wrong in general relativity because here we have an example where the scalar curvature is identically zero, but we still have non-negative mass. The mass comes from the geometry. There is nothing we could integrate to get the mass. Okay? So uh, we cannot take the old definition. Somehow we cannot use the old definition of Newton of integrating something. But it turns out that if we use the potential, then we can get something which transfers to general relativity. So here, um, using uh, the divergence theorem, I can write this as a limit. In fact, it's, uh, I don't have to take a limit if r is sufficiently large, but let's write it as a limit. 1 on 4 pi integral of a boundary of large spheres of the uh, normal derivative of nu. In other words, this definition is not useful, but this definition here turns out to be useful. This is a flux integral. So in Newton's theory we can uh, interpret the mass as a flux integral. And it turns out 
that in a similar way, this mass in this example can be written by a flux integral. So note that in Schwarzschild we have that this mass m is equal to the limit r tending to infinity of, now it turns out not 1 on 4 pi, it's 1 on 16 pi, integral boundary of large spheres. And now I'll just give you the formula. This is d dx i of g i j minus um, d dx j of g i i times nu i d sigma. Just, it's, it's an interesting, it's a short exercise. Just take this metric and verify this formula. So the mass in this Schwarzschild example, this parameter m, can also be recovered from a flux integral of first derivatives of the metric. So think of the metric as a substitute for the potential u. And it's a normal derivative. Um, uh, and so th that's the right analogy. OK? Now, there are more examples. So other examples uh, we could take is um, we could take M3G to be R3 and take out several points. And take the metric G to be delta times the standard metric on R3 times 1 plus, and now you take one mass sitting at x1, and you take another mass sitting at x2, and uh, you keep going and until you have mass number capital N on x minus xn. And take this to the power 4, and then uh, you get a metric which still has scalar curvature equals 0. And um, you can now compute that uh, in this case um, the mass uh, uh, near infinity um, is at least as big as the sum of the masses there. So this would be a picture where you have multiple black holes in the system. Right? So here's say x1 and then here you have and then here you have a very big one and uh, here you have x2 and here you have x3. Okay. So that's another three manifold that is of interest to us. Now in the general setting that I can study, uh, so general case, what one should study, um, I, I simply define definition, an exterior uh, asymptotic flat region, exterior asymptotically flat region, is a three-manifold smooth Riemannian three-manifold with non-negative scalar curvature. Um, and asymptotic decay, so we have we assume that M3 outside some compact set is diffeomorphic to R3 outside a ball. So this is outside some compact set, I have R3. And uh, in this coordinate system there, um, I in this diffeomorphism, this coordinate system, I assume that I have decay conditions. So I assume, now this, this is, looks technical, but it is important that you make 
decay conditions which are sufficiently strong that you can prove something, but sufficiently weak that the physicists don't laugh at you. So you have to assume the metric falls off like 1 on r, like think of Newton, and uh, the first derivative like 1 on r squared, and the second derivatives also like 1 on r squared is enough. And you assume the scalar curvature to be non-negative, and you assume it to be an L1 integrable function in M3g. Assume this. So these are the de decay conditions near infinity. And then if you have a boundary, if the boundary is not empty, then assume that the boundary uh, is uh, a disjoint union of n such spheres. And you assume it's a minimal surface. In the simplest case, you assume that the, that the mean curvature of the boundary inside the three manifold is uh, zero. That's, uh, so this would, be in particular, in this example. So that's the simplest case in physics of a horizon condition. And it's as simple because I assumed that I don't have on the, that because I don't look at this uh, second fundamental form, k. If the k is present, then this becomes an equation of prescribed mean curvature. You have on the right hand side the two dimensional trace of the second fundamental form. That's an interesting equation in itself, but in the first interesting case, you look at this. You assume the boundary is a minimal surface. And you assume it's the outermost boundary. In other words, there is no other minimal surface inside, uh, out, outside the boundary. So no, this is important, no other minimal, closed minimal surface in uh, M3. Only the boundary is allowed to be minimal. This condition is, this last condition is important for defining the mass and understanding the mass and the mass of the black hole because otherwise you could have this picture here. You could have something like this and then this, this surface here has also mean curvature zero, and this one has mean curvature equals to zero. But I'm not allowing to look up to here, because this is hi hidden behind that, this horizon is hi hidden behind this one. So the observer here at infinity, who is looking at this and making observations, he will only see this black hole, he will not see that one. Okay. So it's important to look at the outermost um, horizon. Okay, so now, so that's the math. So, so now, up to now, I've translated physics into mathematics. So now, this is the state. This is the mathematical thing, the mathematical object one needs to study. And on this thing, I want to describe mass and center of mass in a geometric way. So the first theorem that is known, which is important, is uh, due to Bartnik and independent uh, Khrushchev. They say if you take this flux integral formula here down here, down here if you use this formula of M, which was uh, first given by the three physicists Arnovit, Deza, and Misner, the so-called RDM mass. Uh, so this is 1 on 16 pi limit 
Now in the general setting, not just in this example, This thing is a geometric invariant. Exists and is a okay. See, it, I wrote it down in terms of a coordinate system. So you have to check that it is, if you make a transformation of the coordinate system, which fixes infinity in some sense, I'm not going into the details, then you get the same answer. And it turns out that the decay conditions I wrote down here are exactly what you need to prove this. Right? If the decay conditions are weaker, this would not be true. Yeah. And it's nice, the decay conditions are accepted by the physicists. Right? It includes this example, includes that example, it even includes rotating back holes, any isolated system that the physicists know at the moment uh, uh, satisfies these decay conditions. And it's exactly the decay conditions you need to make a definition of mass. And this definition is modeled on this Newton thing in terms of the flux integral. That's where the motivation comes from. Uh, I recall we cannot get a definition where we just integrate some density because of this Schwarzschild example. Okay, um, I should say this is not very geometric. I'm not satisfied with that. I say something at the end of my talk. This is not the nicest definition, but it's the oldest one that works. Now the next interesting theorem was, a very important theorem, um, that you see, I made an energy assumption from physics. We made this assumption here, here, that this thing is greater or equal to zero. The energy flux is non-negative. Now, if we made such a reasonable assumption infinitesimally everywhere, then it should be true that this number here is non-negative. If that is not true, then there is trouble. Then the whole theory is not consistent. And in fact, Penrose showed that if this were wrong, you could extract infinite amounts of energy out of the system. So physics would break down. So it was an open problem for more than 30 years until Shane and Yao proved, yes, indeed, uh, M is non-negative. So this is the positive mass theorem. Proved by Shane and Yao in 89, no, in 79, sorry. And then there was another proof uh, later by Witten, which was different, but more close to the physicist's interest. And the theorem says that in this setting, uh, if the scalar curvature is greater or equal to zero, I write it down again, then the mass of the three manifold is non-negative. And you have equality if and only if uh, the three manifold is just empty. If you if Euclidean space. Okay. Now that is an amazing theorem. Uh, think about it in the suppose you do this one dimension lower. What does it mean? It uh, the simplest baby version of this, one dimension lower, would mean I cannot take the, the, the plane and I cannot put a dent into the plane in a compact region such that the Gauss curvature is non-negative. I right? think one dimension lower, instead of scalar curvature, I take Gauss curvature. I, so, the, so the theorem says I cannot put, uh, change the metric in a compact region of the plane such that the Gauss curvature is everywhere non-negative. If you think about it, how to prove that, uh, the only proof that I can come up with is gauss bonnet Namely, you, you draw a, dry, a, a, a triangle around this bend that you make, 
and you count the angles, it's 180 degrees, and gauss bonnet therefore tells you that the integral of the Gauss curvature in the triangle is uh, equal to zero, but since it's non-negative, it must mean it uh, is identically zero everywhere, and therefore it was no dent after all, it was flat. Yeah. So this theorem, one dimension lower, needs gauss bonnet But it's even more sophisticated because it tells you not only that you cannot make a dent into R3 with non-negative scalar curvature, without, um, yeah, with non-negative scalar curvature in a compact region, it tells you the effect of making a dent, a non-trivial dent, has to show up in the 1 over r term of the metric. See, this, this, this thing here, this is first derivatives of the metric. They, if gij is 1 over r, uh, this is like 1 over r squared times r squared giving you the mass. So the mass measures somehow, just like in this example here, it, makes, it measures the 1 over r term on the metric. So not only does it tell you um, that scalar curvature gives you rigidity like Gauss curvature in two dimensions, it tells you that, it, that the effect of non-negative scalar curvature has to show up in the 1 over r behavior of the metric. If the, if the metric falls off faster than 1 over r, the mass has to be zero. So that was a powerful theorem. Now, <coughs> um, now I come to more recent results, which brings me to flows eventually. Namely, there's a result that I was able to prove with um, Tom Ilmanen. And we proved this in 98. Uh, where we showed that not only do you get non-negative, but if there is a black hole present, if there is uh, a boundary, a horizon, then you get a lower bound on the mass. So you we get that the mass of the three manifold is bounded from below by one on four square root of pi times the maximum from i equals 1 up to n of the boundary of, of the boundary components of the um, horizons or square root here. And uh, equality only on M3 uh, G Schwarzschild equals uh, R3 outside a uh, ball of radius M over 2 around 0 with Gm equals delta times 1 plus M over 2 R to the 4, which is this example. So you have equality and this inequality only in Schwarzschild. This is called the Penrose inequality. Because Penrose conjectured this inequality well in the in the late 60s. So <coughs> that's a sharpening of the positive mass theorem. And that used flows. In fact, we were able to use inverse mean curvature flow to prove this theorem. Now, I'm not going to give a lecture on inverse mean curvature flow. I'd rather go on to mean curvature flow. But I want you to know that this, is proof, this was proved by uh, <coughs> inverse mean curvature flow, where instead of taking DDT of the position, so you have a map from S2 cross infinite time interval into M3G, 
you, have a, you expand the surfaces. So instead of taking mean curvature flow, you go in the other direction in such a way that the speed is equal to 1 over the mean curvature. So in this uh, picture here, the inverse mean curvature flow would expand outward. And similarly, in this example, we would take the largest one and move outwards. And the difficulty for us was the fact that the surfaces would jump. There would be singularities again and would jump again. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to into the details. We used a expanding flow and controlled area volume of the surfaces along this expanding flow and we were able to relate using this flow we were able to relate the area of the initial surface that's the thing that's interesting in this inequality we were able to use this flow to relate the area of the initial surface to the behavior of the flow near infinity and uh, to the behavior of this flux integral there yeah, so we got a monotonicity of a certain quantity, and uh, then we could prove that uh, this is uh, that this is true. Now, <coughs> what I want to get at at the um, second half of the talk is the center of mass, because for the center of mass, one can use now mean curvature flow. So, with this, I think we can say mass, the total mass, is quite well understood with these three theorems, right? So we have a concept of mass, uh, we have the positivity of mass, and we have even a sharp lower bound for the mass if there's a black, black hole present in the system. So I think we, we know now what is mass of, a, of an isolated gravitating system. I think that's quite satisfactory now. Now, what is the center of mass? Now, already in this example here, I mean, what is the center? What is the center? Um, when you look at the picture, you would like to say that the center is here, right? But that point is not on the manifold, right? There is, you know, and if you take any other point, it's not the center. In other words, you have to give up the concept that the center of mass in general relativity is somehow a point in space-time. This is not, not a useful concept. There is no point, even in the simplest example, static black hole, there is no point which you could call the center. There is no such point in the three-manifold which you could call the center. So, but what you do have is you have this nice symmetry. What you do have is this, these two spheres. In particular, there's the horizon. That somehow should be the center, but the horizon is hard to measure for the observer near infinity. The observer near infinity wants to have some idea of what the center is because he wants to c compare the motion of the system with respect to some far away stars or so on. So we need, <coughs> so somehow the idea is rather than using a point to use two surfaces. So this thing has sort of this nice foliation of concentric two spheres sitting inside this three manifold. And now these two spheres here, well you can get a solution of inverse mean curvature flow in that case, it's uh, also going through these two spheres, but these two spheres have another nice property. All the concentric two spheres have um, constant mean curvature. And um, so, so notice that in M3 G 
G Schwarzschild all uh, boundaries of concentric ball coordinate spheres uh, have the mean curvature constant. They are constant mean curvatures, surfaces. And more important, they are, and they are stable. In fact, strictly stable. I should, should write strictly stable. Strictly stable in the sense of the isoparametric problem. You know, you all know, I guess, that mean curvature equals constant. That is the Euler-Lagrange equation of area with respect to a volume constraint. And this constant is just a Lagrange parameter for the prescribed volume. If you don't prescribe the volume, you just get minimal surfaces. So this is the Euler-Lagrange equation for the isoparametric problem. And you can then ask, what is the second variation of area with respect to um, variations that leave the volume um, <coughs> constant. <coughs> and you can compute this second variation formula and it tells you that the second fundamental form squared plus the Ricci curvature of the three manifold in normal direction uh, times any such variation f squared over the two-dimensional surface has to be less than integral gradient f squared d mu over the two surface. This is the well-known second variation formula for area, but because you have the side conditions, you only look at those f uh, with integral f d mu equals zero because variations with such speed f leave the volume fixed. And uh, uh, this is equivalent, of course, to saying that the second variation operator um, defined as uh, minus Laplace f minus f times a squared plus, th this is the Jacobi operator, has the uh, smallest eigenvalue uh, kappa 1 uh, of sigma 2 greater or equal to 0 uh, restricted uh, to f with uh, integral f d mu equals 0. So if you're orthogonal to the uh, constant functions, then the first eigenvalue of the second variation operator is non-zero. And in fact, you can compute in Schwarzschild, in the Schwarzschild case, here in this example, the kappa 1 of um, the ball of radius r, uh, of the boundary of radius r, you can compute, and it's roughly um, 6m over r cubed plus lower order. So this, you know, in, in, in Euclidean space, when you're just in Euclidean space and you look at spheres, they are, of course, not stable. They are nice constant mean curvature surfaces, but they're, they're weakly stable. That's why you see the soap bubbles. But the soap bubbles can drift through the room. You can just blow them away because they have a zero eigenvector, uh, kappa 1, is equal to zero if you are in R3, and you have a three-dimensional eigenspace for corresponding to the three translations in which you can blow the soap bubble. Right? So in R3, this would be zero, 
But in Schwarzschild, because of the mass, it is not zero. So it is strictly positive if r is big. In fact, it turns out you can do the computation. It is strictly positive for all of them, even, even, for, the, even for all the way down to the horizon. They're all stable, which means and, and from, from a point of view of, of the isoparametric problem, you can also see why, right? Uh, because you have this dent in there, you can enclose more volume, say with respect to the horizon, you can enclose more volume with the same area in this um, uh, Schwarzschild example than you can in Euclidean space. And, that's, and you do best if you do it right in the center. Right? So these guys are somehow, you have this special geometric structure. You have these constant mean curvature surfaces which are strictly stable. So the idea is now uh, <coughs> that we use constant mean curvature surfaces in the general case to define the center. Okay? In, so in Schwarzschild, we have these CMC surfaces and they are strictly stable, so you cannot perturb them. So this means, in particular, there are no other constant mean curvature surfaces nearby. Right? Because these guys are stable, strictly stable. Therefore, they are somehow unique. They pick out the center in a unique way. And then the hope is, maybe this works in general. Maybe we can use, in general, simply soap bubbles. And the soap bubbles, uh, minimizing area with respect to a given volume, they will adjust themselves in this three manifold in such a way that they go nicely around the center. And this works. So that's a theorem. The first theorem in this direction I proved with Yao in 1996. 1996. So given M3G um, uh, with, and I uh, should be honest, with slightly stronger decay assumptions on G. You can read it in the paper. This appeared in Inventiones. Uh, then, and uh, M strictly positive. That's the point, of course. If you don't have M positive, you might be in R3, and then you don't get uniqueness. Yeah? But if M is strictly positive, uh, if um, given there exists a unique family of two-dimensional surfaces with mean curvature tau, so near infinity, so if tau tends to zero, uh, the mean curvature goes to zero, and we, we go to infinity, and then up to some finite radius, we get this family of constant mean curvature uh, surfaces, which have the following properties. So the sigma 2 tau foliate the three manifold outside some large ball smoothly we get smooth foliation outside some ball with this with these uh, constant mean curvature surfaces and then these constant mean curvature surfaces are nice and round so if you take the two principal curvatures on these constant mean curvature surfaces then the difference between them is very small it falls off like not 1 over r, which you might expect. It falls off like 1 over r cubed, where r is the area of the, of the surface sigma 2 tau.
And uh, thirdly, they are strictly stable. Sigma 2 tau for tau less than tau 0 is strictly stable. And again, this kappa 1, in the sense of the stability operator that I wrote down, uh, is again roughly 6m on r cubed plus lower order. In other words, it behaves like Schwarzschild. And finally, we get uniqueness. Uh, I, I said there is a unique foliation, but it turns out not just the foliation is unique, each single surface is unique. Sigma 2 tau is the only uh, constant mean curvature surface in, uh, well, M3. We proved at the time that we had to take out a ball of uh, radius roughly uh, tau to the um, minus one half, which is much smaller than the size of the surface. But um, since then, um, uh, Tian and a co-author have improved this result and showed this is actually unique outside some fixed radius. So you can fix the radius independent of tau and outside this radius this will be the only constant mean curvature surface. The only stable, true, sorry. If you drop, the uniqueness is only the, the uniqueness relies strongly on the stability. If you drop the stability, you might have venti tori or all, all sorts of things. Yeah, but if it's stable, it has to be one of these. In other words, you get now, in any of these examples, you get far out, you have this nice foliation, and this foliation has then the interpretation of a center of mass. So, so this, so sigma 2 tau, this family, is the center of mass uh, as seen, yeah, so center of mass as seen from the infinitely far observer. That's the physics interpretation. And in fact, I have just right now a student of mine um, has proved that this fits together with the concept of momentum that the physicists have, right? Because you can do this now, this construction, this constant mean curvature foliation, you can do this in any of the three-dimensional slices, right? I've, I've sort of picked out just one and I've done this construction. Now, you can do this in any slice. You now look at Einstein's equations and you have these many slices inside the four manifold and in each slice, you have this family of two-dimensional spheres, and they are unique. And uh, for each mean curvature, sufficiently small, you have exactly one. You can then ask, how do they move? So you fix the mean curvature and ask, how does that two-sphere with that mean curvature, one over a thousand or something, this big sphere, how does it move inside space-time as you solve Einstein's equations? And it turns out, the physicists have a, con have a concept of momentum. It turns out it moves direct, exactly this constant mean curvature surface in space-time, moves in direction of the uh, momentum of the isolated system at infinity, uh, with the speed uh, being exactly the momentum divided by the mass, as it should be from special relativity. Yeah? So this concept also is consistent with the dynamics of the Einstein equations. Okay, so now how do you prove that result? There is um, by now two ways of proving it, or maybe even three, I don't know. There's, yeah, there's three ways, but two have been carried out. Uh, the most recent one is uh, by, again, a student of mine, Jan Metzger, who has used implicit function theorem methods 
But the original proof was using mean curvature flow. So the original proof that I did with Yao uh, uses mean curvature flow. So the idea is, um, here you have this uh, uh, complicated 3-manifold, and it may be very complicated here, I don't know, something complicated going on there. And I want to construct uh, this constant mean curvature surface far out. So I simply make a guess. I take a big uh, coordinate sphere. So I start with a n2, 0 is simply the boundary of a ball with some big radius r0 around 0. I let that be my initial surface. So given n to 0 to be this boundary of some coordinate sphere, big coordinate sphere, uh, solve ddt of f at p t equals, and now I don't want a minimal surface, so I'm not using exactly mean curvature flow, I want a constant mean curvature surface. So instead of using minus h times nu, I take a difference where h is the mean curvature as before and little h is simply the mean value of the mean curvature. That's the mean value. With initial data this one here. So f, f is a map from s2 into s2 cross 0 infinity into the 3 manifold. Okay. So now short time existence is not difficult because it's just like mean curvature flow with a lower order term. This term here is uh, because it's an integral, it's lower order. You can use a fixed point argument um, to, to uh, prove short time existence of this by using the old uh, short time existence for ordinary mean curvature flow. So you get going. And notice now when you do here ddt of the volume enclosed by the surface n2t, then ddt of the volume is of course ddt is the integral of the normal component of the speed. Right, it's the normal component of the speed. But h, little h, is the average of capital H, so this is just zero. So this that's why I call this the volume preserving mean curvature flow. Okay. And when you look at what happens to the area, Well, uh, you get uh, integral over the surface N2T. And uh, here you get now um, uh, little h minus capital H times h uh, d mu, right? You always get mean curvature times the speed. That's the first variation formula. The first variation of area is always mean curvature times the speed. In mean curvature flow, this was always decreasing because you have minus h squared. But here again, because little h 
as the average of capital H, this is the same as minus integral H minus H squared d mu. So, so the volume is preserved and the area is decreasing. So this is the flow that is searching for a solution of the isoparametric problem. You can view it as the gradient flow for the isoparametric problem. It wants, it wants to make the surface more isoparametric. It wants to have less area for the same volume. And you see, if I can prove that my solution exists for all time and remains smooth, the only possible limit, limit will be a constant mean curvature surface because this eventually will have to go to zero. Right? This, is, this is, after all, positive, so it cannot decrease forever. So if I manage to prove my solution exists for all time, it has to converge, at least the subsequence has to converge to a constant mean curvature surface. So the key point is now to prove a priori estimates that tell me I have a solution for all time. And if I have a solution for all time and I have my a priori estimates, I get a limit surface which has constant mean curvature, and on this limiting surface, I can uh, do computations and check whether it has all these stability properties and so on. Yeah? So the key point is now to prove a priori estimates for this flow for all time. Okay. Now, these a priori estimates, I can't give you all the details, but there are two main steps, two, two components that you have to do. What you have to do is, you see, you see this picture up there. Um, far, I, I'm only do, doing this for surfaces far out. I have no chance that this flow works without singularities. You know, there will be neck pinch and so on if I do this in the interior of the three manifold. So my only chance is that the thing is far outside. Oh, by the way, I should say I had a Long before 96, in, I think in 86, I had proved the theorem, 86, uh, that if M3G, so if the initial surface, uh, in fact in, in any dimension, is sitting in Rn plus 1, and it is convex, then this works. So I had a theorem already, which gave me confidence that I can do something. So in Rn plus 1, for convex initial surface, I already knew this flow will converge to a round sphere. This was in uh, Journal Reine und Angewandte Mathematik. So the question was, can I do it in this asymptotically flat region for these big spheres? And uh, Yao said, <coughs> well, we have to pro prevent the surface from ever going into the interior. If, we, uh, if the surface slides off and part of it goes into the interior of the three manifold, we are lost. We cannot prove anything. So we have to show that it stays outside. And then we have a chance to make this proof work. So that, and the positivity of the mass should help us uh, to keep it centered. So that led to two steps in the a priori estimates. So the first thing you have to do, you make simply the assumption that you're not sliding off. So you prove that if the minimum of f of p at t over the two surface of the um, absolute value, that's sort of the innermost point. If the innermost point is always at least one tenth of this radius r naught that I started with. In other words, you know, here's 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 the bad region. 
Here is my surface that I started with. So I make the assumption that I never, yes, the, the, the bad region, R0 is very big compared to the bad region. So I make the assumption that the, the worst that can happen, that, that, I, that I will never get into this region. I assume I never get into this region. And then I prove that um, lambda 1 minus lambda 2 squared, which is the trace-free part of the second fundamental form in two dimensions. This should remind you of what I did yesterday, controlling the roundness of the surface. Then we prove an estimate that this is less than a constant on r to the 6. And we even get a gradient estimate, <coughs> which would scale usually like a constant on r to the 4, but we can prove that this is less than a constant on r to the 8. <coughs> so there are two constants, c1 and c2, such that this is true. Of course, these depend, these depend on the decay assumptions we made on the metric near infinity. And with constants independent of time. C1, C2, independent of t. And then we do the second step. Then, see, this, this step, by the way, this step does not use the positivity of the mass. This would work even with negative mass. As long as I'm in the flat region, or the asymptotically flat region, sort of the roundness that I have initially, or initially I have this with some constant, and then it doesn't get worse, the roundness is preserved if I stay in the flat region. That has nothing to do with positivity of mass. But the second step says that if, if these two estimates are true, if 1 and 2 hold and the mass is strictly positive, then uh, for sufficiently large, depending on m and c1 and c2, so I have to, this only works for sufficiently large, uh, we get an estimate that the minimum of f pt is bigger than, I don't know, one quarter, r zero. And if you combine these two, you see um, that you have a, a preserved set. You have, a, you have something. So, so the first estimate tells you things stay round if you start in the exterior region. And the second one tells you if it stays round, you can never slide into the middle. And the second one, of course, uses positive mass. If the mass were negative and you start a little bit off center, then you slide off. Yeah. Right. Um, yes, yeah, that I think it's very. It's, in some sense, it's quite geometric. If you, you have this, by the way, you, you, there's examples where you don't just have this at infinity. You can also have this locally. Um, suppose you take a, uh, a manifold like this. Right, and you take a, a constant. You, you you take a surface here. You use the same flow. Then the surface will stabilize. It will just wiggle a little bit, and as t tends to infinity, it will go to a nice constant mean curvature surface sitting up here. 
because this is a uh, maximum point of the scalar curvature of the Gauss cur or Gauss curvature up here, and this is optimal. You can enclose um, the most volume with the smallest area, but if you were to try to do this with this thing down here, take this surface, and if it is not perfectly centered, you wiggle it a little bit, and you try this flow, then it realizes it is doing much better up there. It can enclose much more. It, it can do with much less area, enclose the same volume. So if you get it a little bit off center, it will start to move all around this manifold until it settles down up the top. Yeah? And the same thing that happens here, sort of in the compact setting, happens here in the non-compact setting. If, and, and the mass is playing the role of sort of the maximum of the scalar curvature here, the mass, positive mass means you attract uh, the surface into the center, it wants to be in the center. Negative mass means if you, you repel it to the outside. Okay. So with these two a priori estimates, we get long time existence, and then you prove um, all these other properties. And convergence. And then you do this for different initial radii. Then do this for any initial uh, n two zero equals boundary r zero. And then you get a whole foliation. Okay. Now there's one more application of mean curvature flow. Namely, uh, it turns out uh, you can do also mean curvature flow directly. And this is back. This came out of research that I did with Carlos Sinistrari uh, when we wanted to go on beyond what I told you yesterday. Remember, we had done uh, a complete classification of two convex surfaces. So now we were thinking of, can we do three convex surfaces? But then the problem is uh, you have more singularities. You can have uh, singularities which look like um, a circle cross R2. And uh, you can also have singularities which look like S2 cross R. And uh, in order to understand that, we realized we have to separate these things from each other. Somewhere you have this singularity, somewhere you have that singularity. So we have to localize all our estimates. Now, when we started to localize estimates in space and in time, we came across a localized uh, roundness estimate. Just like I told you about these cylindrical estimates yesterday, we can make them local in time. And um, with this uh, local in time estimate, independent of the initial data, we were able to classify as a first step towards this uh, singularity analysis, we were able to classify certain blow-ups of singularities, um, namely so-called ancient solutions. So we proved the theorem. Um, last year, which says that uh, if uh, f mn cross minus infinity up to some time t, uh, t less than infinity, is an ancient, this is called an ancient because it's is running since ancient times, oh sorry, into Rn plus 1. If this surface in a, is an ancient solution of mean curvature flow, uh, which is convex and in a uniform way. 
and by this I mean that the first, the smallest eigenvalue, or each eigenvalue, that's right, each eigenvalue is bigger than epsilon uh, times the mean curvature um, uh, on mn cross minus infinity t. So suppo suppose we have a solution which is uniformly, which is convex in this uniform way with the same epsilon for all time, then it is a shrinking sphere. Homothetically shrinking sphere. And this is for uh, n greater or equal than 2. Now notice, I need this uniformity condition. Uh, note, there exist solutions uh, convex, non-round, and ancient. These, there, there are solutions that remember these translating Paraboloid type things that I had drawn yesterday. There, there were these translating things, and you can take two of them and sort of glue them together. And as time tends to minus infinity, it looks just like these two things. Uh, glued together at infinity, right? They're on a collision course coming from infinity, but for each time it's a compact convex surface, so you get a solution. All times, so Mn here is compact, of course, Mn compact. So we have a convex solution uh, which exists for all time, but of course it violates this. Yeah, so in other words, the sphere somehow is rigid. If it exists for all time and it's uniformly convex, then uh, there is only the sphere, there's nothing else. Now, of course, these things are <coughs> um, not unique. The, the shrinking spheres you can have at any point of R3. Right? But it turns out if you do this in this Riemannian uh, exterior region, then just like the M, the positive m is breaking the translation invariance of the constant mean curvature surfaces. It is also breaking the translating invariance of these ancient solutions. Therefore, if m is positive, you get exactly one single ancient solution of mean curvature flow on this Riemannian 3 manifold. So that's the theorem from this year. To tell you something new, right? Sinistrari. Of, given M3G as above, so in particular M strictly positive, then there exists exactly one single solution of mean curvature flow. Actually, it's a weak solution, I should be honest, say one word about it. Weak solution of mean curvature flow, n to t, and t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, if there's a, ho if there's a horizon present, such that n to t tends to huge coordinate spheres in a uniformly convex way satisfying this. So near infinity after some time I want them to be uniformly convex and uh, 
and 2t tends to the boundary, to the horizon for t. Uh, oh, sorry. This is this is for t tending to negative times. Of course, these surfaces come. The surfaces come from infinity as time tends to minus infinity. Right? They come from infinity, <coughs> and they tend to the minimal surface. They want to go to the minimal surface as t tends to plus infinity. So you have sort of um, in this, let me finish with this picture. You have this picture of a Riemannian three manifold with uh, maybe some stars, some black holes, and then you start, you have this solution of mean curvature flow which comes from infinity, it moves inwards, and then it, at some stage, it breaks apart into various pieces, and then you have these things here shrinking to a point, right? Remember the spherical collapse? And these things here converge in infinite time to this boundary, and these pieces converge in infinite time to that boundary. And uh, so you get a whole, uh, you cover the whole three manifold with the solution of mean curvature flow. Of course, the breakup here is a neck pinch. Right? There, there will be a neck pinch somewhere here. <coughs> and there will be another neck pinch somewhere. Something will have happened here. Right, so you start with a sphere, then it breaks up, in this example, into three pieces, and then one of the three pieces contracts to a single point, and the other two pieces converge to the minimal surfaces boundary. And this way, in fact, the um, astrophysicists in our institute, they use mean curvature flow to find numerically these horizons. Yeah? Because it's very important for them to know exactly where is the outermost horizon in the three manifold as the, they want to solve Einstein's equations, right? And the horizon may move and they don't know where it is and they need to know numerically where is the horizon. So one uh, of their programs is using mean curvature flow to find the horizon of uh, such uh, slices um, in the Lorentzian manifold uh, modeling isolated gravitating systems. Okay. Thank you for your interest and uh, stop here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this one is not self similar. And under which conditions are. Sorry. Is it type 1 singularity? Oh, if I have a thing, um, it would be a, well, in the, this ancient solution will, uh, in the end, contract to a point, and then it, it will be type 1 here, yes, and if you rescale that, then you get, of course, the sphere. If you rescale this singularity, then you, then you see the round sphere. But but this solution this but there is an ancient solution. It looks in the end at the very end it will be, will become round. But before it will look like two colliding particles. The physicists are very interested in these ancient solutions from the point of view of renormalization group flow because really for them this is like a collision of two translating solutions. Yeah, so they, they they are very interested in classifications. So for for them this was a they were more interested in this than in this whole surgery business, 
right? Because for, for us mathematicians, we want to use flows, also Ricci flow. We want to use Ricci flow and mean curvature flow to make manifolds nicer and, and, and smooth them out and classify them and make uniformization. But for the physicist, this parameter t is, uh, is a cutoff parameter in the, in the cutoffs of their computing their Feynman integrals. And for them, the quantum field theory they are really interested in is going for t to minus infinity. It's going backwards in time. So for them, the interesting physics is the other direction. And that's why they are very interested in solutions that exist for all negative times. They, they are very interested in these ancient solutions. Uh, by, um, to, uh, by energy. To formulate singularity, you need uh, to uh, spend some energy. Right. Am I uh, uh, right that here in this theory, the role of energy plays the area? Yes, right. And, um, but, right, the energy is area in some sense. But if you want um, an estimate how much energy do I need, at least to form a singularity, then you have to use this weighted energy. I think in one of my lectures, in the first one maybe, I, I mentioned this monotonicity formula. Right? I have this, um, uh, we have DDT integral, uh, you have to weight it, you, you scale it just like harmonic map, also you have to scale it just right. This is this uh, formula, and the weight rho. Um, all right, there's another. I think here there's there's two square root of t minus t, and uh, rho satisfies. Uh, rho is the uh, solution of the adjoint heat equation in R n plus one. And rho tends to delta function as uh, uh, t approaches to capital T. At some point, x naught. Right. So you so, so you, you you pick yourself a um, backward heat equation, which concentrates at time t at some point, and then you take that as a weight and make the whole thing uh, scale correctly. Because this one here has a, because it's in our n plus one, it has one such power too many, because it's only an n-dimensional surface. And then you do this computation, and this is monotone. And this tells you uh, that this, that there cannot, in, in any singularity, there cannot be too much of this. And then people have studied how much of this thing do you need to form certain singularities. And then you can indeed uh, look at the infimum of all of these things, right? And then you can say, okay, if this infimum is smaller than such and such, then I can only have the sphere, a singularity. If it's a little bit larger, I can have a cylinder as n minus 1 cross r. If it's a little bit larger, maybe I can have as n minus 2 cross r2, and so on. So we have sort of a cascade. This was studied by Colding and uh, Mini Cosi. Quite recently there has been a paper in Annals of Mathematics where they tried to understand stability and, 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 and exactly this question, how much, of, how much of that weighted energy do you need to form certain singularities? And there's also pa papers by Ilman and, and White, I think, uh, yeah, no, Brian White has also used this idea. So this, if you want to, want to study that. That's a different approach. To, they are interested in how, how big can the singular set be at most, how of dimension of the hinger, that kind of thing. Then you need, then you need this technique. Okay, thank you.